Hi, my name is Austin. This is a presentation I originally gave at the Basic Income Earth Network Conference in Brisbane last year. It's called Global Social Liberalism, a progressive ideology for the 21st century. So what is global social liberalism? We can start by removing global and focusing just on what is social liberalism. And one thing it's not is social democracy. So we can start by explaining how social liberalism is different to social democracy or democratic socialism or, you know, these left wing center left ideologies that most people are more familiar with. In social democracy, sorry, in social democracy, the um, main narrative is what one of negotiated class struggle. So the uh, workplace is the main battlefield. Unionists are the negotiators. And we sort of, what we're always hoping for is a more favorable truce. So the war never ends, but we can sort of push back the front lines a bit and dig in. And then the knights of organized labor will ride out and, you know, defend the boundaries. But the war will never be over. Where there's no further expectation of moving on to some kind of worker state utopia that's been dashed. Uh, it's just a sort of, you know, well, we all still want to um, be engaged in capitalism, but we want to be engaged in capitalism on better terms. And the way we're going to do that is by organizing worker power. Um, social liberalism, on the other hand, focuses on the idea of universal economic rights. So we take the sort of shopping list of liberal rights, free speech freedom of assembly, freedom of religion, and we add some minimal economic provisions to that, like, you you know, freedom from poverty, freedom from homelessness, etc. cetera. Um, it's overtly focused on formal political measures, and it aims to fix the workplace by changing conditions around it. Now, another thing we can do, because we're examining an ideology, we can look at their answer to the most important question that an ideology has to answer. And that is, who am I? My Middle East politics professor, Andrew Vincent of Macquarie University, who's a very respected figure, now passed away, um, he used to say that this is what an ideology is. An ideology is the thing that answers this question, who am I? I am a Christian. I am a worker, for example. So that's the social democracy, social democracy or Marxist answer is, you are a worker. And that means you're a good person because you're, you know, working hard and producing for the community, not like these nasty parasite capitalists who are laying back and they're the, you know, ones who want something for free. Right? Social liberalism has a different narrative. It says you're a citizen. You, we don't, we start with your political nature, not with your economic contribution. Here's another way I like to think about it. You can think of politics in this in this as a, as, a, as a kind of Venn diagram here that I've got. So collectivist, which means concerned with the common good. And we can also talk about the egalitarian impulse, which means concerned with fairness. So fair treatment of the individuals within the group. And then there's the individualist approach, which is primarily concerned with freedom, individual freedom. So we can say that Communism might be collectivist, but not egalitarian. So we're not concerned about treating the members of the, the group fairly. We just want everybody to, to pull together. And if someone's rights have to be sacrificed for the good of the greater community, so be it. This is obviously, there are going to be communists who argue with that description, but please just suspend disbelief and go with me for a second here. Um, neoliberalism, on the other hand, might be considered entirely individualist. So it doesn't matter if people are starving um, in, in, you know, in India or whatever, Bill Gates has, you know, can donate a bit of money if he wants, but really that's up to him, you know, and rich people, uh, are celebrated as an expression of individual achievement and personal liberty, liberty. So social democracy would be, um, collectivist and egalitarian. Social liberalism would be individualist and egalitarian. So our primary uh, we start with the individual and individual rights, um, and then we also uh, try and build in fairness. Or we start with fairness and try and build in individual rights. But 
um, we're less concerned with the the uh, collective uh, except as an extension of the individuals. So here's a question. What does social democracy get wrong? First of all, it's not global. It, you know, it sort of imagines a bunch of individual nation states. And the goal, I like to say, is a, a tessellating map of fully employed nation states. That's the goal. And it's a bad narrative. It's class struggle which is, you know, it excludes a lot of people who are not traditionally working class, uh, sort of mean, makes this, this has this, um, you know, if someone's lucky enough to be born wealthy or born, you know, in, into the, the petty bourgeoisie, they're your enemy, that's it. There's no, there's nothing to be done except to, um, to be in this zero-sum game of, of workers versus capitalists that has been going on for hundreds of years and will continue forever. It's a bad, bad vision, right? Because what they're, they're all social democratic policies, basically, like most you know conservative politics, is based around the vision of a fully employed nation state. That's what success is: is you know everybody's waking up and going to work and working full time and producing a lot of goods and getting a good paycheck, and that's what human life is all about, and that's where it kind of ends. An even worse question, an even more upsetting question that you know, you know you're not supposed to ask on the left is what does neoliberalism get right? And I'm, obviously there's the global thing, but, but the, even more important than that is consumption is good. Neoliberalism is pro-consumption. Neoliberalism wants everybody to have a car and a house, or at least says it does, wants everybody to have a car and a house and consumer goods. Whereas a lot of people on the left seem to, you know, just just want people to be good and for everything to be fair, but the idea of prosperity and, and plenty and and, and um, you know comfort is is less central. Um, it also sort of leaves out something we call the entrepreneurial self. And here I'm thinking of work by a uh, PhD holder from again university of technology brisbane anyhow definitely in brisbane loriana lucioni and she's uh, done work on a basic income and, and attitudes towards it and sort of the ideation around it and one of the things she talks about is the idea of the entrepreneurial self and what she means by that is not that everyone's going to start a startup or have a an etsy brand online what she means is that the the example she gives is a homesteader who wants to go off and live off the grid. That's a version of the entrepreneurial self. But you could imagine, you know, a poet or a busker or anybody whose vision of themselves is not working in a Fordist uh, employer-employee relationship. The other thing I think neoliberalism gets right is what I call superficial diversity. So the there's it's often you know a complaint about neoliberalism from the left that. Oh, we like multicultural, you like multiculturalism and stuff, but only on the surface, because underneath you want everything to be a product. And underneath, you, you know, you want every country to be one part of one big global economy that has the same rules. And I want everything, the whole global economy to be part of one big system that has the same rules. I just want different rules to what the neoliberals want. I want everyone in the world to have good rights. You know, like, I don't think that diversity of, uh, Diversity in terms of workers' rights is good. I don't think diversity in terms of child marriage is good. I don't think diversity in terms of the quality of health care people get is good. We actually only want diversity on the surface. So you can get married in a church. You can get married in a mosque. You can get married next to a big oak tree on the beach or whatever you like, but you cannot get married to a child, for example. That would be an example of superficial diversity. Um, and neoliberalism is always trying to achieve this through you know the world trade organization um or neoliberal organizations and neoliberal actors are always trying to achieve this via global standardization and um making economic systems around the world interoperable with each other and i think that's a good thing we just want that global standard to be uh one of at a higher standard of worker and environmental rights right um yeah it's global obviously so whereas neoliberal globalization is arguing for downwards harmonization, global social liberalism wants upwards harmonization. That's the difference. We don't want to race to the bottom. We want to race to the top. 
Another way of looking at the topic is to just give some examples. Who is a social liberal? Well, FDR was a social liberal. Quite explicitly, he proposed an economic bill of rights, which is a social liberal approach. It takes individual people, gives them economic rights. And a global social liberal was his then widow, Eleanor Roosevelt, who authored the Declaration of Human Rights, so which includes significant economic content. Um, it includes stuff about, you know, rights to housing and, and work and things like that. Those specific economic rights aren't necessarily the ones that I would emphasize, but it is the same approach that I would take. I would also suggest Rutger Bregman is part of a kind of millennial renaissance of global social liberalism. And if you've ever traveled when I was a bit younger and you travel, you go stay at, at backpacker hostels. And there's a kind of global youth culture. To me, it seems, um, you know, sort of middle class global youth culture of everybody who knows Seinfeld jokes and everybody who um, uh, Dave Chappelle and, and, you know, the same pop culture, the same um, uh, sort of basic worldview. And I think the default is essentially amongst this sort of, you know, the Rock, Rutger Bregman's demographic, his Amongst Rutger Bregman's demographic, of which I consider myself a member, his politics is quite standard and is quite popular. And so you can imagine as this generation ages, we're in a position where these values could very quickly become quite powerful. Um, the boomers aren't going to run everything forever. So the millennial renaissance is earnest and hopeful and is not afraid to be accused of naive humanism. Right? So his book, Humankind, A Hopeful History, is all about how, you know, Humans aren't actually all that terrible, and, and, and we often do work together, and, and we don't need to have such a dark view of human nature as we sometimes do. Um, and that underpins, that, that sort of humanist positivity underpins global social liberalism. And hopefully, you, the person who's watching this. Right? Um, so what? Always the most important question. So I'm just pitching a name. And if we if I pitch the name, the idea is that if we start to use that name, global social liberalism, global social liberalism, global social liberalist, then we can recognize ourselves and we can recognize each other as a first step. And if we agree that these are values that we share, individualism, egalitarianism and globalism, then we can start to build a program on those values that's distinct from the same old lefty boring, 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 moralistic crap that's just been going on forever. Then we can develop a broader agenda to succeed neoliberalism, not be an alternative, but be a new mainstream, which replaces neoliberalism and isn't like, you know, always the underdog because that um, is, a, is a way of shirking responsibility, actually. Right, so let's put this in context, in, in context rather, the dominant ide economic ideology since 1945, I think, can be summarized as social democracy from World War II to the 1970s. Then from the 1970s to 2008, neoliberalism. From 2008 till the start of the pandemic, zombie neoliberalism. From 2020 to 2022, we had this kind of pandemic emergency of, of low rates and high spending, which was a kind of unique phenomenon um, and we've in 2023 we're coming out of that and into whatever comes next uh, and I do not think we will go back to uh, what we had before I think it'll be new I think it'll be different there's probably going to be some crisis involved but whatever comes next will draw on all of these traditions uh, what's most likely is a kind of Trumpist economic nationalism so it'll work, draw on the worst of all of these traditions um, and that's sort of where we're headed right now. And you see that, you know, social democracy um, ends up agreeing a lot of the time with um, someone like Trump about tearing up NAFTA. And I agree about tearing up NAFTA as well. What I want are better global trade agreements put in place, not a return to economic nationalism, because that's fucking crazy and stupid and backwards, right? If we, having a global economy is, an, is a profoundly productive thing. All the micro, you know, you can't make um, computers for just one country. If you're going to make a high quality computer, you have to be selling to a global market or you can't justify the investment, et cetera, et cetera. Anyhow, 
the most likely outcome is Trump, uh, you know, Trumpist economic nationalism, which would be a disaster. Um, but the most desirable is global social liberalism. As Gramsci would say, pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. And of course, Gramsci was, you know, a communist that I'm not. And he would say, oh, you know, you're taking my, if say people might say I'm, you know, stealing his ideas. Fine. Yep. I'm taking the bits I like. So long term goals um, that we could agree on as uh, global social liberals would be, I think, a world parliament where, because, you know, we're all citizens of the world. We all get a vote and that world parliament would over, oversee the reforms of global institutions, including global financial institutions like the IMF, World Bank, World Trade Organization. And once we've done that, once we have control over those organizations through a democratic body, we can issue a global basic income, uh, which would be you know, the beginning of civilized life on human earth, when we say we're not going to let people starve because of, you know, conditions outside their control. Uh, we're not going to live in a world where we're putting people on Mars and we're also having babies die of diarrhea and a global basic income can do that. So that's what we should do. Um, and this, I imagine, would be issued in a new global currency tied to IMF, SDRs or equivalent. And we would have a new global reserve that's not the US dollar because, you know, America is not the boss of the world and they need to manage their own currency according to their national interests. And their national interests are going to diverge from what we need from a global currency and a global monetary system. So the era of the dollar has to end at some stage. And when it does, we don't want it displaced by the euro or the yuan or some other national currency. We want a global currency managed globally for a global economy. And now there are three different strategies I would suggest, which are how we might get there. One is called the Alliance of Democracies, and there's versions of this sort of out there. I, mean, I think the best idea of the, the, the version of this is just what I call a trade desirability index. So democracies all prefer to trade with each other, more or less. Right. So there's a there's a strong um, Darwinian impulse we apply to national economies um, and we punish non-democratic economies and we reward democratic economies and we favor each other, each other. Um, and, you know, we can factor in other things. You can also factor in, oh, well, this is a third world country. So they get they're a poorer country. So they get some other, you know, bump up in the index and lower tariffs when they're accessing the developed economies, et cetera. You can imagine a um, what we do at the moment is we we randomly put sanctions on people for political reasons rather than having a standardized set of rules um, which you can follow to get better trade access. Uh, and you, you can know that it's going to be consistent rather than, you know, geopolitically determined. Um, and the, the other another strategy is reform of the united nations so we use the internal mechanisms detailed in the united nations procedures and they we trigger them and, and change the rules that's part one of the strategies that will have to be a part of it the third strategy which i like is the most is the global tribunate strategy now i'm taking this idea from george monbiot the british writer he wrote in his 2003 or 2004, early 2000s book called The Age of Consent. He talked about a world parliament and the example he used was how the tribunes of ancient Rome, the tribunes of the plebs, were sort of established independently of the Senate and then thrust upon it. So rather than, um, so the Senate in this case is the global institutions, the IMF, World Bank, United Nations, et cetera, et cetera, and we, the people, he suggested we do this through the World Social Forum in Porto Alegre, uh, for example, that, you know, we the people just somehow organize our own parliament, our own bunch of representatives, and they show up and say, hey, guys, we've been elected by the people, so you have to listen to us now. And if no one listens, we, you know, start torching cop cars and smashing bank windows and all that, you know, other stuff that people do to force political change. So yeah, the people of the world set up their own parliament or equivalent and impose a process of reform on the global institutions. 